an absolutely brilliant and powerful and engaging session. I, I'm, I'm really fascinated by that street mode, man. That, that, that sounds so awesome, you know, giving yourself protection with, from fraud on a financial app. I feel like every session I listen to, it, it, it feels like we're building or creating the building blocks for a more equitable and, and fairer society. There's so much going on today. It's, it's amazing, absolutely amazing. Um, now, our next session, I, I told you we would uh, talk about AI again. And our next discussion is going to be all about advancing equitable AI. So for the next uh, discussion, please welcome Jen White, host of 1A, onto the stage. Hey, Jen. As artificial intelligence rapidly changes our world, how do we ensure that technology benefits everyone? What are the challenges, the opportunities, and the possibilities of making this an accessible technology for the world? Here to help us answer those questions are Anna Ariola Makanju. She is the VP of Global Affairs for OpenAI, and Dr. Ben Vincent III. He's president of Howard University. Anna, we hear a lot about the dangers of artificial intelligence, but I'm hoping you can share with us maybe some of the positives <laughs> we're seeing right now, specifically in the education space. Absolutely. Um, I wish I got to talk uh, more about those, because I do think that this technology has an incredible opportunity to increase access, and education is one of the areas we're most excited about. Um, there's a wonderful partner, for example, that we have called Robot Somali. And there was a great Washington Post piece about them, I think just yesterday or the day before, where they are um, creating textbooks in Bambara, which is the most spoken language in Mali. And so they were able to create these incredible educational materials that are bringing many more people uh, to, uh, it's ensuring literacy for a much wider percentage of the population. Um, we have Duolingo that's allowing refugees to learn English and pass English tests to access more educational opportunities. And we see, in particular, teachers um, really, really engaging with this technology. And there have been some studies done by a number of um, outside organizations where sort of the more students per teacher and the lower resource the school district, the more the teacher really loves generative tools because they're able to have really extensive lesson plans and do the kinds of things that are more accessible to better resourced schools. Dr. Vincent, where are you seeing artificial intelligence being used right now to advance uh, issues around social equity? Well, first of all, um, uh, thank you for, for that question. It's absolutely um, uh, on point. There are so many areas, in fact, where uh, AI is, is, is already making a difference. Uh, one of the areas uh, that really, uh, really stands out for me is really helping us live better lives. One of the things uh, that we notice just here in the Washington DC area, which is a microcosm, microcosm for what's happening nationally, are uh, th those who are living in the poorest levels of our society have a 21 year uh, life expectancy less than those who are the most affluent uh, in our society. So AI already uh, is intervening and helping, helping conjure better cures, better treatment, better diagnoses, um, uh, which all lead to helping bridge gaps such as these. Um, and, and this can be compounded because the eyes of AI, if you will, uh, have the ability to, to penetrate the data, to, to study uh, situations in ways beyond uh, human capacity, uh, allowing us to also make connections between uh, disparate social determinants, for instance, that, uh, that, that impact health outcomes. Uh, and so through the lens of AI, one is able to stitch together um, the ability to do new cures, new treatments, et cetera, that might not have been possible. So be, we're at the very early stages of this, uh, but our universities and, of course, already in our society, we're seeing these things at play. And you can go through other fields, um, the field of law. We have a law school at Howard, for instance, uh, already conversations about how AI can begin to, to sift through um, uh, cases so that one can understand and design better policies. 
um, in, in our social work school, for instance, we have uh, individuals who are very optimistic about the role of AI to better provide uh, predictive lifestyles, uh, to better uh, figure out through, through community mapping, to understand how can we better locate places and spaces where people can have improved, uh, improved fortunes for their own personal future. So AI is having a really fundamental impact in these areas. We know right now there are major headwinds pushing back against diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. And I'm curious to hear from both of you the role leaders can play in helping their organizations be better prepared to talk about how this technology can be used, how to give their uh, staff a, a framework and language around how to use artificial intelligence in those efforts. Anna? So, <clears throat> I mean, I think one critical thing is just that we are cognizant from the outset that this is something that we need to work on, on at every level. You know, so when we train models at OpenAI, we look at pre-training data to make sure that we are identifying, you know, especially harmful material. And then also we have a very long post-training process, which is where we like really work on model behavior. So for example, we train our vision models to ensure that if you ask them a, a stereotype-based question, like if you look at a picture of a woman and you ask what job should she have, it simply won't answer. And obviously we have a long, long way to go in tech. <laughs> and uh, th there is a lot of work to do to make sure that it, this is a diverse place and reflective of diverse opinions, but just to continue to say that this is an important thing for us to work on. But I think the other really critical thing is that I th one thing that uh, sometimes tends to happen is when people of color are uh, engaged in this conversation, it is simply to talk about bias. And I think that's really problematic because what we really need is inclusion of uh, diverse people, uh, diverse populations at every stage, and to uh, have them be part of the development process and the deployment process and understanding how to actually make sure these tools are benefiting communities rather than be boxed into a very limited conversation on bias. Dr. Benz. So I'd like to remind leaders out there uh, of one thing. Diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, is never in and of itself the goal, the outcome, the vision uh, and the goal has always been a more harmonious, more successful pluralistic society in which everyone benefits. And that makes for a better world. Uh, and so DEI, the headwinds that we're facing now, um, they do not obscure the goal or the mission in any way. And so all we do is we're polishing our techniques, we're polishing uh, our, our strategies. And what that looks like, at least from my humble opinion, in the frame of AI and, and the work of AI, is working closely to make sure that the emerging, uh, the emerging generations of coders uh, are coming from as broad a spectrum as you can possibly imagine, uh, from socioeconomic background, cultural and ethnic backgrounds. It's incumbent upon us to begin that outreach in a very intentional way. Uh, and secondly, to partner with institutions of higher learning. I invite uh, all industry leaders in particular to, to partner with your local educational institutions uh, because those will be, those partnerships will be the nexus point for forging that next generation. Um, Howard is already engaged in a very meaningful partnership with MasterCard, for instance. Um, we are working uh, and in fact have created a computer and artificial, uh, intel uh, a computer artificial intelligence uh, data science center. Uh, where, um, which is still in, in its infancy, but we hired six faculty members, uh, we've got 30 students. Partnering with us, for instance, uh, an institution that has been dedicated to, uh, to the uplift uh, of, of those who have been in some ways um, cast aside by American society in, in, historically, for, for an institution like ours, uh, social justice, equity, and inclusion is part of our DNA. Those types of partnerships uh, then create that next generation. It is, uh, we can't do it independently. It must be done together. You have a, an interesting perch as the, the president of the university here in DC. What are you hearing from students about where they see both the opportunities and the barriers when it comes to um, artificial intelligence and, and the role it can play in their lives and careers? 
So there are several things. I think, first of all, our, our students, uh, and it depends on the type of institution that you're at, not all institutions of higher learning ha are equally blessed uh, with, with resources. Uh, and so sometimes uh, students who may want to run in a technical area, depending on their institution, may, not, may, may encounter a barrier there. Uh, and so that's, again, why these partnerships are necessary so that the, the playing field can be leveled out. Um, we also, in my particular campus, we are finding our students uh, very concerned uh, that uh, the current generation of coding, uh, the, uh, the, the production of algorithms, um, has not been, uh, let's say, as the net has been uh, not been cast as wide as it, as it could be to solve the types of problems they're seeing in the future. Uh, and so there is a concern that, especially as quantum computing comes to the fore and uh, has the potential to rapidly implant some of the already um, disparate or dis, um, uh, the structures that, that divide, that they're worried that they're going to miss out. Uh, and they're worried that uh, if they don't have uh, the full spectrum of technical expertise right now, it's only going to become harder in the next round. So um, these are the types of conversations some of us are having on our campuses. How do we even the play in field? How do we get a more diverse spectrum uh, of those who are in the field? And how do we also make sure that AI uh, impacts all of, the, all of the various disciplines that a university constitutes. So Anna, how is OpenAI approaching that question, broadening the pipeline so that the people in the room doing that coding, that they represent a diverse swath of the US? So we do have actually, um, we have been contributing through the National Science Foundation um, to uh, credits for our tools, specifically aimed at HBCUs. We have a partnership with Operation Hope for half a million dollars to leverage AI for um, these kinds of inclusive services. And I think AI literacy and, and helping people cross that barrier to ensure that they can access these tools is one of the areas we're most excited to partner with HBCUs. We're actually, with Operation Hope, also right now working on an on a ethics council for AI uh, that Sam, our CEO, announced uh, with Operation Hope last year that will really bring in civil rights leaders and leaders in the community to help us understand how we best you know, access the talent. And we also have um, a program that brings in people who are not AI researchers into open AI. So because we, you know, every discipline is going to be critically important in order to inform um, this technology. And that, will also, that also allows us to bring in a much more diverse set of voices into the uh, organization because unfortunately still in terms of uh, you know AI specific programs they are not especially diverse um, and we have to work on that too but we also have to find other ways to bring people in mm -hmm. there's vision mm -hmm. <laughs> and then there's execution yeah. and from each of your perspectives how can leaders make sure they create that bridge between the vision and the actual execution of that vision dr. Vincent yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent question, and uh, one of the things, that, there's so many facets to it. It's almost a Rubik's Cube. of uh, uh, It's hard to solve, but when it is, my goodness. Um, the one thing that I would uh, point out is the, the need at this moment to make sure that our policies, policies and policies and policies help protect uh, and, and help enable uh, the future of, uh, of this incredible technology. Um, and so, uh, and that, uh, is, that requires a, a variety of uh, orthogonal and multidimensional partnerships as well that stretch into a variety of arenas, government, plus industry, plus education, various sectors working together. Uh, so uh, to, I think that will help unleash, if you will, some of the, some of the potential safeguards uh, while at the same time channeling uh, in focused ways some of the greatest potentials of the technology as we see it at this time. So policy uh, is, is what I would uh, put to the table. I hear that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> it's a, it's a, absolutely a great answer, but I think that it is the other piece that you touched on, which is partnerships. At the end of the day, OpenAI is very small, and what we do is build large language models. So there's going to be a limited amount we can do ourselves. So we have to find people who can execute on this vision. And I think what we maybe originally felt that if we build these amazing tools, then people would just pick them up. But it's, it's increasingly clear that we can't wait for that. We have to put our thumb on the scale, and we have to find people who 
who are ready to execute um, and, and want to bring uh, these tools. This is, this is why we have an entire team focused on identifying what are the most impactful partnerships that are driving this technology in the direction we want it to go, that are ensuring that they're going to be accessible to people who would not otherwise have access. Um, and so we are, we have now hundreds of really incredible partners that are helping us with this execution and we're constantly looking for more. So always welcome um, ideas on that front. President Vincent, how are you measuring success when it comes to both the integration out of, art of artificial intelligence into um, your educational programming for Howard, but also in terms of matriculating students who are prepared to work in that space? Well, honestly, we're still figuring it out. Yeah. Um, it's only been, what, 18, 19 months since uh, ChatGPT kind of rocked the world. Um, but I tell you, what, what, what we're doing right now is uh, we're, we are looking internally uh, to figure out where are the places where we can make uh, improvements in terms of upskilling our workforce uh, to meet the challenges, where are the places where we can uh, build more capacity in our teaching and our curriculum so we can touch more students across the curriculum. Uh, and we're also uh, looking for ways in which we can contribute meaningfully to the research. Um, and so we, I, I put these out as the areas that we're focusing on. We don't have yet calibrated the metrics um, in a very fast-moving space, um, but these are the things that, that we're on alert for, and I should finally say also making sure that we try to understand as much as possible um, a deep learning, and, and uh, which has really, uh, there's so much mystery around that. Um, and what does that really mean? And we don't really know a lot about our own minds, much less these minds that we're creating. So this is another, these are the theaters of activity that, we, that we're looking at. I always think it's it's important to leave groups like this with questions to ask themselves, to continue asking, to ask um, their their teams as we're moving forward in this rapidly evolving space. So from each of you, two or three questions that you want us to leave today, um, asking ourselves and asking our colleagues. Anna? So I think at the end of the day, this technology is completely in its infancy. It is the least powerful today that it will ever be, and it is the most um, accessible today that it is ever be, will ever be in many ways. So I think everybody should ask themselves in their organization, what is a really easy, simple thing that I can do today with this technology? And um, it, it, because getting comfortable with it now is absolutely critical to being able to ensure that it succeeds. Dr. Benson. For me, I, I've been reading this book by Melanie Mitchell on artificial intelligence, and I was reminded of something uh, that goes back to our own human history, and it reminded me of that, that moment of the age of reason in the 18th century where uh, Descartes, uh, one of these great philosophers, said, I think, therefore I am. Uh, and the question I ask all of us is, if it thinks, then what are we? We'll leave it there. Anna, Dr. Benson, thank you. <laughs>